الله نبدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام افضل التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحابته ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي uh, we welcome you all to um, our online event our monthly online event alhamdulillah this is our second one uh, that we were able to uh, coordinate for this year. I just ask that everyone please be here for those people who are entering into the room, please mute yourself inshallah ta'ala and uh, just be respectful and mindful inshallah ta'ala as we uh, go through this event. Uh, again, we want to thank all of you for attending and we are streaming live to Facebook. Um, so please be mindful of your sound. Uh, there are only uh, four people speaking tonight, myself and the three guest speakers, Bidinah Ta'ala. And anyone, if you have any questions, please put it inside the chat, uh, Bidinah Ta'ala. So just uh, before we start and we hand over the floor to uh, Dr. Abu Zaid, we just want to mention some of the things that we're doing as an organization. Alhamdulillah, uh, we started our nonprofit last year, and our goal is to um, uh, help individuals who are uh, struggling with economic or struggling with uh, financial difficulties so we have an economic relief program our sadaqa jariya program and our zakat program and we also have our social impact program and this is part of the social impact program that we're doing um, which we are trying to create social impact in our muslim communities right specifically our faith base our masajids and uh, islamic centers and so on and so forth we know that they're uh, you know understaffed or underserved and the the gaps that they have in those communities we are trying to help them and assist them fulfill those gaps so this is what we do as an organization, alhamdulillah, um, and we're doing a pretty good job and we're based in Tampa. Again, if you look here really quickly, these are some of the things that we have going on. Economic relief, our sadaqa jariya, we have our Arabic classes, we have youth mentoring, youth programs, we have our Friday chat nights, we have uh, free mental health programs that we just introduced, and we have uh, seasonal programs. So we are doing a lot and we're still in the infancy stages of this nonprofit. Um, and... Again, these are some other things that you guys can look at. You can follow us on Instagram. We have the website. We will have a next round of Arabic uh, starting either pre-Ramadan or post-Ramadan, but we have uh, three full classes right now going on on Sundays. Um, we have our a youth event going uh, that will occur in the St. Pete Mejdid, um, ISSP. So that will be on February 18th for those of you who are in the Florida area. And our next Friday chat night will be February 3rd, which will be a Mejid al-Qassam which is uh, in Tampa, which is the second largest mansion in Tampa, for those of you uh, who aren't aware. And inshallah, we'll be running a next mental health group, um, inshallah, after Ramadan. And without further ado, uh, again, this is the schedule for tonight, inshallah ta'ala. I know uh, that up north, the Salah for Salat al-Maghrib is a little bit earlier uh, than us. So, uh, Sheikh, uh, Dr. Buzay, please let us know whenever you have to uh, stop for Salat al-Maghrib. And then we have tonight with us three guest speakers. And the first guest speaker is, uh, guest speaker is Dr. Abu Zaid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him for his efforts and his time. And we appreciate you know, everything that he's doing for his community. This is just a short background about him. Dr. Abu Zaid holds a degree or degrees in Islamic studies as well as traditional uh, uh, sciences. And he has ijazah or ijazah in the 10 modes of Quranic recitation, books of hadith, and many other Islamic texts. He's the author of The Children's Request, and he has published a number of translations. And he's a student of Sheikh Akram al Nadawi, who was uh, one of um, a leading scholar today in, in our time, uh, who has produced uh, several Islamic works. And, um, and Sheikh Abu Zaid, he also runs uh, the Quran Literacy Program um, in New Jersey. Um, and he is a founding member of YM, as well as a long-standing member of the ICNA community, which we all know. So, Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My greetings to all our brothers and sisters um, down in Tampa, sunny Tampa. Um, I was driving here to my brother's house in freezing rain. I could hardly see anything and just... I was just visualizing what Tampa must have been like. So may Allah bless all of you and uh, may Allah keep you safe and secure and happy. And inshallah, I look forward to coming one day, visiting you guys in person. 
Um, and I extend my gratitude to our brother, uh, Najam Zaman. Um, the last time I actually met him, well, we had wonderful memories. The last time we met each other was in Fez, Morocco. There were some wonderful times in the company of Sheikh Akram and others, and we were studying Islam and meeting scholars, and those are some wonderful times. Um, the nice topic is about the youth, and um, if you have any difficulties with the audio, just let me know, inshallah. Um, I wanted to speak about this idea of, uh, so I know we have a few minutes. Um, when This is a topic that I've been hearing about since the 80s. Um, I mean, I think growing up, that was the number one topic. What do we do for our youth in every masajid, every community? It was a huge topic in our organization that we were involved in ICNA, and it led to the creation of YM. Um, prior to the current YM, it was actually under a different name, Young Muslims for Faith and Action. So was, and there were a number of other youth organizations at that time. Uh, there was Islamic Workers Association, uh, by our Caribbean, Caribbean brothers and sisters you might be familiar with. We were all working together, roughly, trying to figure out a solution for the youth in our community. And alhamdulillah, eight decades later, uh, we're still interested in this topic because it's a relevant topic. Um, I wanted to begin my discussion uh, grounding it in um, the Quranic worldview. I think there's a verse in the Quran that is very um, significant that speaks about the cycles of life. And that's a useful way to start this discussion. Allah says in Surah uh, Rum, Allah says, Allahu ladhi khalaqakum min da'fin, thumma ja'ala min ba'di da'fin quwwatan, thumma ja'ala min ba'di quwwatin da'fan wa shayba, yakhluqu ma yasha wa huwa al-alim al-qadir. Allah says, Allah is the one who created you from da'f. And there's another way of reading uh, in some of your masahif, it might be da'fin might have memorized Dorfin. They're both correct. Allah created all of you from a period of weakness. Thumma ja'ala min ba'di da'fin quwa. Then after that period of weakness, Allah brings you strength. Allah grants you and endows you strength. Thumma ja'ala min ba'di quwatin da'fan wa shayba. And then after that period of strength, Allah brings weakness, a period of weakness, wa shayba, and old age. This is how Allah creates. He creates as He wills. This is a cycle of life. When you look at our ages, our, the periods of, or these transitions of our lifetime, we start out the period of weakness. When we're born, we can't even fend for ourselves. We're in total dependency upon our parents. Um, Allah says, he took you out of the wombs of your mothers, not knowing anything. And then he granted you hearing and sight so that you may be grateful. So we start out with weakness. And then over time, as we grow up, we become stronger and stronger. And when the child discovers how to walk, look how he frets about. And, you know, it's a, it's a newfound strength. And that's a good metaphor for everything that happens to us as we get older. We develop the ability to talk, we develop the ability to think, and then we begin to read books. And when you're a youth, and this is relevant to the youth, the youth is a period of kuwa, strength. It's something amazing. It's something, it's a great blessing of Allah. And young people, when you go to the gym, you feel like you can do anything, right? You go to um, you whatever you do, the hobbies you're involved in, you can do anything. But then the cycle of life is such that Allah after successive and subsequent strength, he starts bringing weakness back into our lives. And those of us who are in our late 30s, early 40s, we begin to feel that. Like, And, and you know, you all, all of us have wake-up calls. Um, when I was in the early 40s, I bought a mountain bike. And I just, like one of my childhood hobbies was biking. And um, I wanted to rekindle that. So I bought a mountain bike and I took it to like this, this great place with, and I wanted to ride the mountains. And I I had no idea I was no longer the age that I used to be when I used to ride bikes. So my first ride, I bought a $3,000 nice flashy black mountain bike. 
with jumpers and everything. It was so I my first five minutes of riding in the middle of um, this mountain trail. Um, I forgot about the brakes. I pressed the front brakes rather than the back brakes going down like this mountain trail. Then I flipped like uh, and I and I fell down. The bike is on top of me. And then then I stood up and I really wait. What happened here? And I had bruised my ribs and all sorts of things. That was my first ride after many, many years. Then that that was the beginning of a series of realizations that you're not as young as you used to be. Um, you have to watch yourself now because after Quwa comes Da'af again. That's the cycle of life. So anyway, the reason Allah shares all of this is that, you know, this is these are the cycles of life we have to be aware of. But for the youth, that period of strength is an incredible period. It's a period of of strength and vigor. And and um, if you look at the community of the Prophet wasallam, you know, there were so many youth around him. In fact, if you look at all the great Sahaba, um, barring a few, almost all of them were in their teens. You know, in I teach Hadith a lot. We have the Muqthirul Hadith are the seven companions who narrated um, the bulk of our hadith, the vast majority of the hadith that we have, whenever we read our books of hadith, they're narrated from seven companions. And they're the companions, who are they? We all know Abu Huraira, Anas bin Malik, Abdullah ibn Umar, Jabir ibn Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, and Abu Musa al-Ashari. All of them, if you look at their ages when the Prophet passed, they were in their teens. That's something amazing to think about. The our hadith literature, all of the hadith that we have, no one beyond these seven companions narrated more than one thousand hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, um, and all of them. Abu Huraira was in his teens when he started teaching hadith, and he's the number one most prolific narrator of hadith. He was twenty-seven years old when he started teaching hadith. That's after a lifetime of study and learning and memorizing. So, how old must he have been in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? In his teens, Abdullah ibn Umar, likewise, and it's been, none of them were in their 30s even. All of them were in their teens when the Prophet passed. They were in their late teens or early 20s. So if you look at all these great companions um, around the Prophet, look at Aisha radiallahu anha. She's a special case. Allah chose her uh, to be very young, and part of that, that was a divine wisdom. She was very young, um, and she absorbed so much she was under the tarbiyah of her father as Siddiq. And then she was under the tarbiyah of a Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this beautiful upbringing. And why? Because she was going to be one of our great teachers of the ummah. We have so much we're indebted to her. Almost one-fourth of the Islamic law comes from her and her teachings. And, you know, the other companions, they used to marvel at her. They would say, you know, anytime uh, we had a difficulty and nobody could solve the problem, we would turn to her. And she would be able to solve the problem for her, for us because of her knowledge. So all of this was because, you know, the community of the Prophet ﷺ was surrounded by young people and youth. And it's hardly, you know, a handful of old people. The oldest companion you can think of is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And, you know, we think he was an old person, but he was 38 or 37 years old when the Prophet passed, something like that. So even that is not really an older person. So... This is something amazing. When you look at our history, our history was forged by the hands and the legs of our youth. So that's something amazing. That's something that should inspire us and it should teach us a number of things. One of them is that the community was organic. And that was that's my primary message to the entire community. But now I have a specific message in a few moments to our youth. Um, and I'm going to push back on a lot of you know, uh, the type of thinking that goes on in the minds of young people, because I, I believe there are certain things that we have to say and they need to be heard. Um, and that is that in our modern society, um, often this idea of being a young person, youth is seen as a handicap or from practical terms is a, is a handicap. So we're raising people and creating this artificial category of youth um, I mean, it's a real category, but when, you, when, when it becomes like an identity and a way of thinking, then our young people go around expecting certain things and being in a privileged attitude and expecting because the society is geared to making these prolonged categories that last much longer than they should. 
and in order to sell video games and pastime and sport and all of these things. So we have young people being raised um, not to be men and women, but to be youth. And the question I have for all of you is to think about this. All of these young people that I mentioned, they weren't the youth committee of the masjid. They didn't, they weren't a separate category from the rest of the companions. They didn't look at themselves differently. They were part of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were part of the companion, the Ashab of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they didn't look at themselves as something different. Modern society wants everyone to have identities. These, fra um, you know, f fractured schizophrenic identities. Well, you're a woman and that's all that matters. So even as a Muslim, everything that you think about is as from the perspective of a Muslim woman or you're a youth. And even as a Muslim, everything you have to look at from the perspective of a youth or you're this or you're that, you're immigrant or you're from this community or you're brown or you're black and that becomes your identity. So we have all these competing identities and we're taught to make that the focus of our thinking, our actions and everything. Whereas, who has some makumul muslimin? Allah says in the Quran, he made you Muslim. He didn't make you black and brown and young and old. That's not your identity. Your identity is Muslim. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's, this topic is very important. And with my background, uh, don't misunderstand me. I mean, I've come from a whole lifetime of working for, um, you know, being part of YM and ICNA, and I believe in all of that. But at the same time, I think to create separate categories is problematic because it, it, it reinforces a certain type of thinking that we're different. Our youth need to be organic parts of our community. And I'll share with you then the final thing, like uh, there's different ways of approaching life. One way is to complain about things, right? And we're, I think we're turning into a generation of complainers. And I'm speaking about the youth, I'm speaking about everyone. Um, I'm speaking to myself. This is self-introspection. Um, so real men, real women and leaders they don't complain. They take charge of their circumstances, um, and they and they create the circum. They create the environment that they need, and they're leaders. That's what the leaders were. That's where the Ambiya were. I'll give you two brief examples. When we were in Morocco with uh, Najm, um, not this time around, but one of the one of my visits to Morocco, we met an amazing um, uh, Muslim female scholar, Sheikh Naima. Uh, um, she, she's from Tanja. She, she has an entire empire of Islamic schools and camps, and she's raising generations of people, um, teaching them Islam in, in, in a very effective way. Um, and when we visited her, it was incredible um, the kind of work that she was doing. She has drivers. She has meetings all day, and she just made time out to meet us. Um, and she has thousands of people working for her. Um, so she told us her story, just what struck out, and what I wanted to share is that she wanted to memorize Quran, and when she was growing up, there was no opportunities for women, right? So, and she couldn't find any place where she wanted, that she could memorize Quran. Nobody could accommodate her. The communities sort of failed her. But what did she do? Did she complain? Did she create a group and start complaining and, and, and bringing people uh, or bashing the ummah? She was part of the ummah. She created her own circumstances. She memorized the Quran. She gained knowledge. Now she runs an entire, what I call an empire. Um, I'll share you a, a story closer to home. One of my students, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to know her as a, she's a female. Um, she, she's not that old. She has children. Um, she memorized the Quran and she's, she has ijazah in the Quran. She has ijazah in some of the Qur'an. She's learning. Very bright uh, uh, female, mashallah. But her story is incredible. She wanted to memorize the Quran. She went to, there was only one school for hifs in Queens. And I think, Najm, you're from Queens also. Or you have some roots in Queens. Um, she went to the school in Queens, and they only had a, a, a male hifs program. So they rejected her. They rejected her application, and then she went to them. She, they said, no, we can't. This is a boys' school. And today's time, um, you know, one approach would be some people would go on this media campaign and, you know, you know, I mean, it's, it's wrong what happened. Um, but let me tell you what she did. 
She didn't complain. She didn't start a, a campaign against the school or the mosque. It's a Darul Ulum. So she went, she was so persistent. She said, I want to memorize Quran. She went to the principal and she basically talked to him and said, look, I don't care about what's going on. I just want to memorize Quran. You tell me what I have to do. So she was so persistent. They created a special environment for her where they taught her private. She was the only female. She memorized the entire Quran from this Darul Ulum that only catered to male students. They didn't have a female program. But just think about that. She was, she was young at the time. You can take charge of your future, or you can complain about what the communities are doing and failing um, your uh, demographic or your identity. So many people complain. But there are other types of people that don't complain. They know what they got to do. And they really, they, they create their own circumstances. And the real leaders, that's, that's who they are. Modern society, they, you know, they teach you, well, you know, um, you are who you are. You don't need to change. Everyone else needs to change. And that's not really an Islamic paradigm. There's a, I think one of the, one of the models that defines the modern generation is sad. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's cold. I've, I've heard it a couple of times and it really, whenever I hear it, it, um, it amuses me and it bothers me. Um, you know, they say, you do you, I'm going to do me, right? That, you know, it's a validation of who you are. No matter what you are, you could be a, a guy and you wake up, you feel like a woman, you do you. That's fine for you. You want to do this, you want to do that. There's no talk about, look, we're believers. There's a tarbiya process that goes on and what we need to do. And we need to be submitters to Allah and his messenger. Um, we have to do things we don't like. But modernity teaches you, it's all about your feeling, validating yourself, whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever, it's, it's all about that. Everyone else has to adjust to that. So my message to the youth is that we need to grow up. You're, if you're young today, how fast your youth is going to go away? You've got five years, ten years tops. And look at the COVID situation, look how fast time is flying. This is not a permanent state of your life. This is not an identity for you. This is a period of strength that Allah gave you to do certain things. So you need to be grateful and we need to raise our game. We need to grow up and we need to be believers and we need to uh, fix this broken ummah that we find ourselves in. And you can do it. The youth have incredible potential and incredible um, resources in terms of what they have in terms of their mental strength and their physical strength. Um, and at the same time, I recognize all the communities need to invest in the youth, and they're not doing what they should as well. We need to invest in everyone, um, especially the youth. Every community needs to have a program for the youth. Every single community needs to have, um, you know, look towards the future. And not that the youth are separate from the community, they're an organic part of the community, but at the same time, we recognize that there are challenges that um, people of different age groups go through. And those challenges can only be met by people who can speak their language. So every masjid should have a youth director. Every masjid should have a youth committee. And by and large, when I look at the masajid, like this title, Have the Masajid Failed Us, um, I'm involved in a lot of masajid. And most of the masajid that I know that I can recall on the top of my head, they're doing pretty good. They all want the youth to be there. I mean, there are deficiencies, but I really can't think of a single masjid off the top of my head in all of New York, New Jersey, and we're talking about hundreds of masajid that I've seen and that really don't want the youth there. So it's just a set of circumstances that, you know, don't allow them to be better than they already are. So rather than complaining, my message is let's get involved in our communities, let's help them improve. And most masajid would love to have young people uh, part of their boards and their shuras, I think, um, or in my experience at least. And they would love to hear from the youth and would love them to be involved and help out. Um, but that requires us to not complain and to be more action oriented. So I ask Allah to bless this organization. I ask Allah to bless all of you. May Allah give us the tawfiq um, to fulfill our mission that Allah created us for in this life. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So, um, so I just wanted to mention to our brother Khalid, he was supposed to co-host with me, but uh, his daughter uh, was sick. So um, he was actually at the hospital last night. And he couldn't make it today, so I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, you know, give um, her shifa'ah. Um, 
she's one of the students here in one of the Islamic school. So uh, alhamdulillah, thank you for your input, uh, Dr. Abu Zaid. Uh, you know, you hit it on two points. So one of the questions um, that I would ask you is, because you made a very interesting point and a greater value point. And, and I think the ones, like you said, that the youth were actually embedded as not a separate entity into the community, but rather they were part, uh, you know, organic growing up part of the community. Um, those are the ones really that uh, the communities that ended up thriving, right? So what, what would be the message to any community leaders to uh, encourage, because sometimes we do find some organizations and they're very, um, you know, it would just be the old doctors on the board. It would just be the older brothers or the brothers with the businesses or, you know, Keda. So what would be the message to encourage some of the organizations, the Islamic organizations, centers to allow for this participation uh, to occur? Very good question. Um, so I read, um, I'll share with you what my, my friend, Sheikh Hasib Noor, if any of all of you know him online, he posted something today was very relevant to our discussion. I was driving here and just came across on my feed. These algorithms are amazing. They're, of course, they're engineered, but sometimes Allah works his magic in his own ways. So he said, every, um, you need seven people to run a masjid. That was his message, short message. Every masjid needs seven people to run it. One scholar, one female scholar, one imam to lead the prayers and to do the health programs, etc one youth director for ages 13 to 17, another youth director for ages 12 and below, one outreach scholar if needed, and one scholar counselor, scholar slash counselor. Um, that's amazing. So that's, that was something, you know, so you, every masjid needs an imam, right? A, the religious head, and he doesn't have to be there necessarily the entire time. And you also need someone to lead the prayers and teach the Quran, right? So that could be separate functions. And then the youth director, he hit it on the uh, on the head by saying that like the youth is not one category, right? A ten year old, eleven year old, twelve year old have different needs, especially females, um, but even males than someone who's seventeen, eighteen. So that's a different type of language, different type of skill sets that's required. Um, I predominantly worked in YM with older high school and college. I don't know how to speak to children, so just if you lump. You know, like just people who, are, who work with old, with the teens, they won't. Uh, you know, not everyone can speak to younger ages, right? Eight, nine year olds, and so you need different levels. And then also, well, what I'm hearing, yeah. uh, Chef, is that you basically what he's saying is to invest in personnel and positions, not not structures necessarily. So invest in the people that can facilitate those. Um, you know. Uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think. Our community, there's an overemphasis on the structures, the physical structures. And I say that a lot, and I agree with you. I'm sure we're on the same page. We're building these mega structures. And when it comes to youth, what we think of is having the state-of-the-art gym, and having millions of dollars of fundraisers, and all these massages that we fundraise for gyms and for structures. And, you know, but we can't even pay for a youth director position. So that's a deficiency that I find in, in the communities I'm involved in where I live. You know, we have great structures. We have, you know, just where I live within 15 minutes, we have, you know, massive masajid that have great structures, but half of them don't even have imams. And the ones that do have imams, they don't have youth directors. And that's something, that's an idea that we pitch to the community. It's very hard to sell to the board. They don't find the resources to invest in a youth director. And there were talks with some of these masajid getting together, get one united youth director and, you know, it never really worked out. Some, one of them does, the other don't. Um, but you really, you know, if you're building, if you're raising millions of dollars to build structures, that's not what we need. And growing up, you can test to it. Like growing up in Queens, I spent a lot of time with my childhood in Queens in the ICNA Center. The massages that were a defining part of our childhood, they were broken structures. They were storefront massages. Um, the roofs used to leak, and they weren't like really beautiful places. Our kids, if we bring them there, they'll be like, ew, what is this place? But those were so beautiful. That's where Iman was forged. That's where we found our identities, right? So it's not the structure. It's not the buildings. It's the personnel. It's the institutions. It's the mindset. That's what we really need to uh, invest in. And, and that is something that we are, you know, that I see in Tampa. Um, again, we have uh, 15 to 20 masjids, beautiful masjids. Uh, but there isn't actually any uh, uh, 
uh, a single paid part-time youth coordinator or a full-time coordinator. And, you know, so we see this as a gap and, you know, alhamdulillah, we have good relations with the massages and they're allowing us to do programs and stuff. And not just, not just something, YM, YM had their program yesterday in one of the big gyms in our masjid. Um, nice. And they get like 60, 70 youth, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot, but, you know, I'm, we're, I, we want to create consistency, longevity, you know, not just a, 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 a khatira and basketball, you know, like a, a well-intentional programs that can support them so that they can grow up in the communities and, and become benefactors, you know, so that's what we're aiming to. And, yeah, um, you know, so Alhamdulillah, but, uh, you know, and, and, and Alhamdulillah, we, we, appreciate your time and your you know your input and i think uh because you have been in that tri-state community you know exactly you know the type of scenario and the situation that we are fa- that we're still facing with you know 30 years later and and i would say the one the message that really dropped the ball on it too they've, they've lost a lot of youth you know people uh, uh, young brothers who are now imams in bigger masjids they lost the opportunity to hone in onto their skills because they didn't recognize the strengths you know, um, and I think that's another issue, but we'll, we'll save that for another time, you know, and they mm-hmm. lost some of those great people, those young people who were 14, 15, that, that are now imams and Quran leading Tarawi, and they went on to other communities, but had they taken the time to look at their individual strengths and see what they could have given to the community, they would have had a, a flourishing community. And uh, did you want to wrap up with any final point? or as a yet No, I think... Uh... Right. Right. That should be enough, inshallah. Oh, yeah, inshallah. And uh, we have a kalam from Ali ibn Abi Talib when he says, uh, abdu man allamani harfan wahidan. You know, Allah. And, and, you know, we benefit so much from you. I know that you're doing so much for the community up there. I do see the work, and I want everyone to go and check out Quran Literacy. Uh, is it dot com, right? Dot com. Quran org. Quran Literacy dot org. Dot org. And you could see some of the classes that. Um, that they have and the works that they're doing with the, with the communities over there, inshallah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and to bless your family. Assalamu alaikum. You well, alaikum say, say, I know you have to probably pray now. I think it's the prayer time for you, maybe. Is oh, it? yes. My group came in. I didn't even notice. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum, alaikum. alaikum. We, will, we, will, we will bring you to tap, inshallah. We will inshallah. Try. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> And uh, so for the next speaker, uh, we do have, um, and I believe he is on already. Uh, so we are, uh, Sheikh Akil, are you here? Hal anta mawjood? Hadir. Wow, mashallah, mashallah. It's very nice to see your smile. As I always remember you with a beautiful smile, Sheikh. Kaifa halukum? Quite well, Barakallah. How are you doing? I'm doing Alhamdulillah. And we are blessed to have you today uh, to present, you know, on this topic. Uh, Dr. Abu Zaid presented his piece. And there is no right or wrong answer, but rather we value the input uh, of, of the, the, the leading people in our community from their personal experience, from what they see, what, has, what they have done right, and, you know, the things, the suggestions that they have. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our beloved Sheikh today. Um, Pull up the slide one second. So hopefully you guys can see this. And um, so Sheikh Akil Ingram has spent some years studying Islam at the University of Medina in uh, Medina, <laughs> the city of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, and I have always known him to be a very, uh, you know, a very active in the dawah scene and teaching in the masajids and giving back with his khutbs and his classes. Um, alhamdulillah, he's had the opportunity to participate in uh, gatherings with with ulama uh you know around the world i think as well too you know and translating for some shiuk and i know he didn't put this here but i believe he's also translated some books as well too uh, you know from arabic into english um he's been involved uh in the um hold on, hold on one second Uh, he has been involved in the apologetics of Islam within the United States of America, and he has provided extensive, uh, or extensive family counseling and has engaged in uh, communities across organizing across the country. Throughout this time, he has become an author, educator, translator, and an orator. And I think, you know, and I've always, I'm seeing his posts all over, mashallah, and uh, in major conferences and, and seminars. So we know that he's doing uh, very good work with his community and the communities over up north. Um, he has studied judicial law and jurisprudence with the, the Islamic University of Medina and psychology at the Thomas Edison uh, State University. 
and he is also the former director of language and theology at the MMM M and M Learning Center and a former administrative chaplain with the Department of Public Safety. Mashallah. And I know I could keep going on, uh, but uh, we will give uh, Sheikh Akhil a, a his opportunity to speak. Barakalafi. Tafadl. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Surallahu Sallam ala Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Firstly, I would just like to take the time to um, to, to thank you, uh, my, my dear brother, Sheikh Najam, for having me here and uh, inviting me and being here with the other esteemed panelists. May Allah bless all of you. May Allah preserve you all. My, my first thought in this discussion is to mention a, a verse of the Quran. Our Lord, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, the best and the exalted, he stated, Al-Manu, Al-Manu, Al-Banunu, Zinu to the to Dunya that um, wealth and children, they are the adornment of the life of this world. And we want to open with that because of the fact that we need to understand, or we should understand, that wealth and children um, are not inherently, or they're not inherently uh, negative by by nature of existing, but but rather these are things that are beautiful, that are beneficial, that add value to our lives, and particularly when utilized in order to assist us in our journey into the hereafter, then its value increases even ever more so. So we should understand this, and this should be a goal uh, for ourselves and, and with our, our children as well, to, to bring our children into this type of a space. My, my, my second thought to offer is actually um, concerning masajid and being conscious of the purpose of our masajid. We, we, we understand from our sharia, we understand from our legislation that the foremost purpose of our masajid actually is the following, that the masajid, the houses of Allah, they have been constructed for the purposes of the worship of Allah, the recitation of the Quran, and the remembrance of Allah. This is the first and the primary purpose of our masajid. And we state this not to negate that the masajid should be the center of our community, not to negate that our masajid should be offering services as much as our masajid are able for each branch of the life experience that a masjid is able to carry. Um, not to negate any of that, but to simply raise the question. And that question would be, is it the responsibility of the masajid to raise and to save our youth? Is that the job of the masajid um, themselves? And um, I, I raise that not necessarily to provide an answer, but, but just to provide a, a, a line of thought. And I, I say that because looking toward the masajid for engagement with our youth is largely a, a, a Western construction. And, um, I say that because if we look to the school systems that we um, have all come up in at this point in time, originally the school system's purpose wasn't even to fully educate children, but rather it was meant to be an assistant to parents in what parents were educating children inside of their own homes. It was meant to be an extension and the support of that effort, but it grew further because responsibilities of the parents um, increasing and them having to work more, and then children began to be in school full-time, and then it became an issue uh, of where we're, we're in a point now where uh, the school system itself is actually involved, whether we like it or not, with raising our children. And now we're to the point where we even have after-school programs where our children in school are in school during school and then after school. So I, I mentioned this just to um, question whether 
we are following this same type of line of thought when it comes to our misogyny and our children. And if we are shifting uh, responsibility from ourselves uh, over to the misogyny, when the misogyny should be present, it should be an assistant, but not necessarily a, 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 sole, um, a sole provider of that particular service. Now, when we, when we say that, we can take a, a another step here. And um, if you might allow, I would like to just jump into a, a psychological thought uh, very briefly, because the challenges that we, we have with our youth um, largely revolve around a sense of identity. And when a human being is, is developing an identity from a very early stage in life, the child's identity is very largely premised upon the child's immediate environment, which is often the parents, often the household, which is why we will see children um, mimicking their, their parents, uh, modeling what goes on inside of their household and such. But something interesting occurs as a child enters into adolescence. When, when a child enters into the stage of adolescence, what is uh, common to happen in the psychological development of a child is that the child will begin to look outside of the self, outside of the household, outside of the family for a sense of, of identity. And uh, this is at this point, this is where we begin seeing children um, looking more so into, it could be a, a, an entertainer, um, it could be someone who is in sports. It could be someone who is in, in music. It could be someone that has some form of, of public accompli accomplishment, and we call them idols, right? And the child will, will look to this and begin emulating um, certain speech and behavior of those that are outside of the home. Um, we would hope that it would be positive models, maybe school teachers, maybe maybe scholars, um, maybe others that have uh, prominent roles and positive roles in, in society, um, in whatever those roles may be, doctors, engineers, lawyers, whatever the case may be. But in, in this space, when the, the child is beginning to look outside for, for identity, and the, the child is looking to be accepted as well um, by peers, then the challenge that we have, as we're all well aware, is that we, um, in many of our communities, we don't have a full Islamic environment. So when the child is looking outside for this, for this identity and, and for this support and looking where the child fits into the world, well, uh, then there are a lot of influences that are there. And along with those influences that are not uh, influences that are congruent with the ethics and morals of Islam, then we often will enter into a space of risk behavior. And um, I, I like to just very briefly throw some, throw some stats um, at us. There is an organization that we have here in the States called FYI. It's called the, uh, the Family Youth Institute. It is a Muslim organization that is very much targeted at assisting Muslim families and Muslim youth uh, in our development, um, largely from a, a spiritual, psychological, and sociological standpoint. And they conducted some studies, and there's some things that they found. So I'm going to, huh? I'm going to uh, iterate to you all some of these stats concerning risk behavior. And concerning alcohol use, interestingly, 47% of Muslim college students have drank alcohol within the last year. Of that 47%, 74% of them identify themselves as moderately religious, to very religious. And of this percentage, 9% of that 47% will go on to suffer from alcohol use for the remainder of their lifetime. We also have in risk behavior, illicit drug use. Now, when it comes to uh, illicit drug use, this stat was a, was a stat that was a little bit more difficult to procure. But what we have found is that 
of American Muslims use drugs. 52% of that 25% began with marijuana as a gateway drug. We then have the risk behavior of tobacco use, and we're stating tobacco use to not limit it to just cigarettes. 37% of Muslim college students in the United States of America use tobacco products. And of this particular group, only 26% of them reported water pipe smoking being prohibited in Islam. When it comes to the risk behavior of premarital sexual behaviors of Muslims who are non-married and are of college age and in college, then 54% of them have reported and in, in engaging, have reported engaging in premarital sexual behaviors. So these are the stats. And we're stating this so that we can be aware um, more pointedly of not just that these risk behaviors exist, but how prevalent it actually is um, amongst Muslim youth. And these stats holding true and understanding that we are looking to um, assist our youth in coming into their own identity. And uh, when we say coming into their, their own identity, we have to understand that many of our youth, and of course, uh, many of us here speaking today, that were youth uh, coming up in, uh, in Islam, we, we actually have a triple consciousness, a triple consciousness of identity that we, we have to learn to navigate. We are Muslim, we are American, and we are whatever ethnicity that we happen to be. And uh, in our identity, we may prioritize those three differently, but we're looking to navigate those three and who we are. So then we have to be able to, um, to assist our youth in these particular areas. So um, I have a, a, a humble suggestion, and my humble suggestion would be to hone in on our youth within our masajid in the age range of 15 to 20, not negating those that are younger or older than this. However, typically um, in our masajid, in our communities, to, to be quite honest, generally speaking, we do quite well with our children when they're much younger and when they're inside uh, of our homes and their identity is largely based on what's going on, going on around them and, and the family and such, um, our, our, our parents and our massage don't do a terrible job at this stage, right, broadly speaking. But it's at the point that they begin to look outside of the home uh, for their identity when we begin to come into certain challenges and when the ideas of risk behavior uh, be begin to emerge. So, um, and when we look after these ages, when we're into the college ages, the risk behavior is already sat, is already settled in. So I, I believe that 15 to 20 is a, a, a very uh, important age for us to be focusing on with our Muslim youth and for our massage to be focusing on with our, with our Muslim youth. Um, stating this, and as I, I come closer uh, to, to a close, then, we need to position our masajid to be assistance to solution. We are in need of having um, not just theological activities or spiritual activities, but we're in need of having support groups, uh, support groups in our masajid or in our communities around our masajid that can target our youth with the challenges that they're, they're facing real time. I would, I would also suggest that we have uh, peer-led activities, that we have peer-led activities, meaning that we have youth um, themselves that are leading in some of these activities, whether they are religious activities or they are secular 
uh, activities. And when I state peer led, it gives them a sense of empowerment. It gives them a sense of, of, of onus when they themselves um, are engaged in leading their own peers. And um, we can be involved, but perhaps from the standpoint of, of, of monitoring or, or overseeing um, this type of a thing. My, my last point to, to kind of kind of mention here is that we, we, we need to, um, or we should rather, I won't say we need to, we, we should understand that we were looking to assist our youth in their development. And there are certain assets that are developmental assets that we can utilize to assist our youth. Now, speaking to these developmental assets um, requires, um, well, more, more time than we have here today and requires us to do kind of a deep dive on them, but we can at least mention them and we'll, we'll list them out for you. Uh, one, we kind of just mentioned support. Support is a development, a developmental asset that we should be providing to our youth. Secondly, empowerment. We should be seeking to empower them, not necessarily to control them, not necessarily looking to make the models uh, of our own selves, but we should be looking to prepare our youth for the world as it will be when they are the age that we are and not preparing them for the world as it is today, because the world as it is today will not be the world that they will be living in tomorrow when they are in the spaces that we are in now. Thirdly, boundaries and expectations, um, directing them to um, the, the limitations that they have or the proper ways or the incorrect ways at times to do things ourselves before they reap um, wrongful, uh, wrongful consequences from certain things outside of society. We can set those boundaries ourselves before, before time, before they enter into that. Um, also, constructive use of time. Um, focus them in directions where their time is used properly because when there's a lot of free time and a lot of boredom, this is when trouble brews. Uh, or this is when, 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 when trouble uh, begins to brew. Um, next, we have commitment to learning. And uh, largely, we, we do well with this particular area of a commitment to, to learning for, for our youth, having positive values, uh, gearing our youth with social competencies, um, meaning that uh, assisting our youth with planning and decision-making, with, with, with empathy, um, with um, conflict resolution skills, positive conflict resolution skills, things of this nature. And, and largely, and lastly, um, assisting them and directing them with a, a positive identity. I, I think that if we utilize these developmental assets, they can be of a, a large assistance uh, to our youth and our massage at utilizing this uh, can, can really can really assist them. And uh, answering the question, have our massage at failed our youth? Uh, I think that is a, a subjective, uh, a subjective question. Um, whether we think that the Masajid or our Masajid are actually responsible uh, for our youth or not. Um, but if we are saying that the Masajid are responsible for our youth, then th there needs to be a, a lot more uh, interpersonal engagement, meeting our youth where they actually are, as opposed to just having um, committees or, or, or structures or just saying that we have programs when in fact they're, 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 they're empty and they're not producing uh, as they should real time on the ground. Uh, this is what I have to offer. Hopefully there's some benefit in it somewhere. Um, so very great point, alhamdulillah. And I think, you know, everyone is coming, you know, all the speakers are, are bringing their own, uh, you know, a point of view to it. And, you know, it's, it's all well taking actually, you know, just building on the same subject, you know, yes, the question is subjective, you know, the question could be positive, the question could be negative, you know, depending on how you're looking at it. And most of us have spent a lot of our life growing up in the masjid, attached to a masjid, involved in a masjid, yeah, or in the masjid, you know, so we have a lot of, of you know, experience in, in that realm. And I love the fact that you mentioned, um, about the developmental age. I think uh, Eric Erickson, uh, when you study psychology in the stages of development, he says that the, uh, which is, is something that we don't disagree with, uh, the age for the identity issue is uh, between 12 and 13 to that older 18, 19. So it is, that is where the youth or any uh, person developing will develop their identity. 
during those teenager years and that's very important that we have a strong influence on our you know muslim youth at that age because once they go outside and they seek it again if they get the wrong advice in the wrong direction you know they'll end up with you know a, a different outcome than we hope um the other point too i love that you mentioned um, about peer support and, you know, uh, peer-led activities and support groups. So one of the things um, that we have done here, uh, just so you know, our Friday chat nights, you know, we we started to speak about social issues that are affecting, you know, the Muslim community. So we spoke about LGBTQ, which is a very heavy topic. As you said, we have to prepare our, our youth for, you know, when they go off and this is something that's normalized for them right now, right? We spoke about suicide, you know, so we're speaking about, these social issues and for the support groups that alhamdulillah we hope to do more of we ran a mental health support group for the teenagers speaking to them about those issues that they're facing relationships right because when we were younger you know unfortunately we didn't have that guidance how do we navigate in the public school dealing with the opposite gender you know is it so we we as grown-ups now we are having this conversation with our youth it, we didn't have the luxury of having somebody uh doing this for us but we saw that this was a gap you know, and we are teaching them uh, these topics. Financial education is another big one. You know, the Muslim community, unfortunately, our Islamic schools are still on the same curriculum that's preparing uh, students only to become doctors, engineers, and lawyers, and neglecting the financial aspect of the reality of today. You know, how, do, how does a person become successful financially? Anyways, that's another topic. So I would ask you, so basically you're saying as the masjids are, instead of looking at them as the primary uh, primary uh, uh, sole caretaker of the, in the youth, they are more of assistance because the job does fall on parents. And I think that's a strong point too, that some parents, you know, um, that is the number one, you know, that's the number one uh, person to be in charge of the youth is, is the parents, right? So, um, and then the second one is because a lot of Muslims will end up going to their massages and being, you know, we met all, all of our Muslim friends at the massages, right? Right. Um, so what would you say is, um, how, do you, how do you bridge that gap um, between, especially from folks who are so busy with, with all of their obligations and work that they don't focus on their youth and, or, or their children and how do you bridge the gap between the parents of those individuals and then, you know, the massages that are not taking that approach as, as some of the things you've outlined that we have to do? But how, would you, how do you bridge that gap between these two things? Okay, now that, that's an excellent question. And, and what, I would, what, what I would offer, and um, I'm going to offer something. And, and what I'm offering is, is something that um, I'm not saying that, that myself or anyone else is the best at. But, but I, I think that this becomes an issue of, of life planning. So when we are having our children, um, when we are engaging in our, in our marriages and such, there should be a, a direction for our marriages. There should be a plan. And rearing our children and making time for our children should be a part of that plan. So um, that being the case, at, at some point, we need to look into avenues or plan out avenues where we as parents can get more of our time back, um, be that through uh, economical development, like what you're, what you're implying, uh, be that through uh, investments or entrepreneurship, or, or, or be that in, in our work atmosphere, um, entering into positions in our careers that will facilitate a, a lifestyle for us where we can eventually be more involved. Um, it may not be immediate. We may have to grind in uh, in some of the early years, right? In our in our in our twenties, or maybe even to our, our thirties. But it should be a part of our plan that we, we're not going to just grind forever and never make time for our, our families ever. Um, that being stated, though, and uh, I'll I'll close with this. That being stated, though, the the other part to that question is is really um, what you've been saying and and uh, what Dr. Abu Zaid has, has already stated as well. Um, because everyone is so busy. Um, we do have to create, support, lean on our masajid, or if not the masajid, lean on uh, creating uh, programs within our community that can fill that gap for us. 
and 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 that's a great answer and i think that uh, as you mentioned dr abu zaid he you know he mentioned that point that and it's something that i've learned over the years that you know you really can't wait on people or organizations to do something if you see that there is a need you start to build you start to do it you know you don't wait on everyone you know you start that you push forward you know you'll have your haters you'll have your people saying no they can't do it no just if you see that there's a gap or the need in your community just go ahead and make that effort on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if your intention is pure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up uh that door for you you know so alhamdulillah uh you know we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and to bless your family and hopefully we could also get you to come down to Tampa inshallah and visit us and you know we could uh you know have lunch and visit the Islamic communities here and, and hopefully we could see each other soon inshallah ta'ala um, uh, and um, we're going to pause here because we have uh, Salat al-Maghrib in Tampa. Akhil, Sheikh Akhil, you're more than welcome to stay on. If you have other obligations, then you know, you're know you free to go as well. Uh, but we'll touch base after. We are recording this, so I will share it with you, inshallah ta'ala, afterwards. Um, but we're going to pause here because we have Salat al-Maghrib uh, here in Tampa. And um, we'll continue. We'll take a 15-minute break. And we will resume afterwards, inshallah. So you can be back here at 6.15. Barakallahu uh, So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the next speaker. And I do see him, Sheikh Yasser. Kaifa halu ya Sheikh? Kaifa l'umur? Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for having me today. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Iltafiyah, sawtak, inshallah. Can you hear? I can hear you, but it sounded a little bit low. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah, much better, much better. So, طيب. so, um, Sheikh Yasser Siddiq, um, sorry, yeah, well, you, you pronounce Siddiq correctly, it's just spelled wrong. No, no, okay, طيب. Siddiq, Sheikh Yasser Siddiq, alhamdulillah, you know, I've had the pleasure of meeting him uh, very recently, actually, when he visited Tampa. And again, you know, we love to stay connected with the people of knowledge. Um, alhamdulillah, we had uh, Dr. Abu Zaid here earlier, uh, Sheikh Akhil as well, and alhamdulillah, we have Sheikh Yasser. And actually, you know, um, I didn't realize this at the time, but we actually are, are, are getting actually different viewpoints from uh, a, a wide variety of age, uh, age differences, like I would say, uh, because uh, between Akhil, Dr. Abu Zaid, and Sheikh Yasser, there are distinct uh, age differences, right? So we're actually hearing the positions of, of you know, from from, from different people, from different ethnicities, from different backgrounds, right? And different age ranges. So, you know, alhamdulillah, it's a blessing to actually uh, to have this in our religion. As you can see, the Islam is not a religion that discriminates against, you know, we're all Muslim, alhamdulillah, um, and we believe in uh, the same Lord and we follow the same prophet uh, due to, you know, our statement, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. So this is a blessing that Islam transcends ethnicities it transcends races it transcends nationalities and cultures you know this is what brings us here together and we all are you know striving towards the same mission so Sheikh Yasser at the age of uh, you know um, after you know being raised and born in the United States at the age of 14 he or 13 he went back to Sudan uh, and he started to on his path uh, to seek knowledge again something uh, that Dr. Abu Zaid mentioned that you know the Sahaba they were very young uh, when they were learning from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they became the greatest scholars of fiqh, hadith, tafsir, the Arabic language, and so on and so forth. All of the sciences we get from them, right? All of the hadith and the chains and, you know, we get from them. So, you know, Sheikh Yasser, alhamdulillah, he studied in, in Sudan. His primary focus was uh, science of hadith and science of aqidah. He obtained over uh, 24 ijazat from scholars around Sudan and Egypt. And he also traveled to Saudi Arabia, where he sat with the ulama of the Haramain. And 2013, where he returned back to the United States, he pursued his bachelor's degree for the American Online University. Uh, he worked with various masajids uh, as a youth director, then as an imam, and finally a resident scholar. So Qiyasir uh, Siddiq, is, um, he currently works as a senior business analyst for the federal government, while volunteering with a few nonprofit organizations, such as Al-Furqan, Ikna Relief, Helping Hand, uh, SAPA, and Sadaqat USA. He's also active in his local community, providing El Mia programs, science of hadith seminars, and workshops for youth and young adults. So without further ado, alhamdulillah, that's a short background to him, um, and we will allow him to present his piece. Uh, you have about 20 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes for question and answer. Barakallah. Jazakallah khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. 
وأصلي وأسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن سار على نهجه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الجمع والبعث والدين ثم أما بعد الجمع الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, First and foremost, thank you about the Najm and Shaykhan al-Habib for uh, the invite and um, Husn al giving us the benefit of the doubt to be amongst يعني, great brothers, mashallah, tabarakallah um, Usually, subhanAllah, when I speak at the very end um, I realized that uh, the brothers, the speakers prior, covered the entire, yani, subhanAllah, the entire show. So uh, I'm just going to add a few small points about um, the topic of today um, in the title of um, this session, Have Masajid Failed Our Youth? And as um, it was mentioned earlier, that question could be a, a, a two-way street question or a two-edged sword. It could be more of a blame towards the Masajid as in we are saying they have, and it could be no, as in we're saying that they haven't. Um, I, alhamdulillah, as you, as you can see, I'm pretty young um, in age. I'm about 30 years of age. But I have traveled, alhamdulillah, to over 36 different states in the United States and given talks in over 600 masajid, alhamdulillah. So I've been around with the youth a lot in different masajid. Um, first and foremost, the age of... The, you know, the Shabab youth, it's one of the most important ages of your life. It's where your fundamentals, your principles, your foundations are built. If you don't build it at that time, I won't say it's impossible to do it later on, but it becomes difficult when you're older in age. That you grow up, you have a career, you have a family, a lot of responsibilities come up that time when you are in your shabab in your teens is the best time to build your foundation um as you can see on my bio at 14 when i started subhanallah i gave my very first khutbah when i was 15 years of age in sudan to a masjid that had over 2 2500 probably audience and i cannot forget this day whatsoever that i was usually i was the muaddin to give the adhan for the khatib and it was 126 p.m and the khutbah is at 1.30. And the imam called at 1.26, said that he was involved in an accident and cannot make it. One of the brothers from the board, he stands up and says, can we have someone give the khutbah? I've never seen that happen. They would usually make phone calls. But they stood up in front of the crowd of people waiting and asked if someone can give the khutbah. Nobody raised their hand. I said, let me give it a shot. I stood up and... I'm sitting uh, at the mimbar, and the mimbar was pretty high in, you know, in the masjid. And when you sit down waiting for the adhan, there is like the, like the podium in front of you pretty much. It was high, like higher than where, where I was sitting. So now I'm sitting there. I can't see the audience on the other side unless I stand up. So I remember standing up at that age, and I, the minute I stand up and I see you know, 2,000 people, I sat right back down. I was so nervous and so afraid. I remember talking, um, the khutbah started at 1.32 after the adhan. I remember talking um, about Surah Al-Asr, the tafsir of Surah Al-Asr. And I spoke and I spoke and I spoke until my knowledge was done. Everything in my head was out. I said, I sat down so I can, you know, between the two khutbahs. And I'm hoping that I would look at the watch and it would be 1.57 and 1.58. I look at my watch, it's 138. Only six minutes passed, and there is nothing left in my head to say. I got up and I'm so nervous. And I said, for those who came late, I'm gonna repeat the khutbah for them. The worst excuse ever. I repeated the khutbah again. 143, 144, I finished the khutbah. I start the prayer. I make the mistake in Al-Fatiha in the Surah Al-A'la. I'm so nervous. It's my very first time leading a prayer, and it's a Jum'ah prayer. At that age, you're hoping that people will come and encourage you, will thank you. You know, at that time, you don't really know much about ikhlas, riya, you know, showing off and just sincerity and all that stuff. You want people to come and praise you. It was the opposite. People were saying that the khutbah was invalid. They need to repeat the salah. And alhamdulillah, right as the, where the imam prays, there is a door right there in front of me where I can exit from to outside the masjid. I left the masjid and I had swore that I would never come back and lead a prayer again. One of my teachers told me this is an opportunity for you to improve. 
and start seeking knowledge. And that was how I started. Can we put the blame on Masajid that they have failed the youth? It's hard to, to say that because I have seen um, Masajid, they have, um, they want, for lack of better words, they want our youth to come to the Masajid. But as um, Dr. Uh, Brother Abu Zaid or Dr. Abu Zaid, Jazawallah Khair, spoke earlier, um, one of the things that I personally disagree with, and I think that it is a, a big, a huge issue, is a lot of these masajid, and I talk about plenty, plenty of these masajid are wealthy, have large, you know, properties or compounds, um, masajid with gyms, and they have a decent amount of money in their, you know, bank accounts for the masjid, of course, but they do not want to spend that money on youth directors full time. And if they do, we're talking about, I don't know about you guys in Tampa, but the Najim or Dr. Abu Zaid in New Jersey or New York. Um, I don't know what the salary range looks like, but I personally, subhanAllah, in the last maybe four to five months alone, wallahi, no less than 12 to 13 masajid all over the states have reached out and done serious interviews with me via Zoom or invited me over to come as a youth director. And they're talking salaries between forty to $60,000. In their mind, that's a high range to pay a youth director. And that's subhanAllah, I, from my perspective, if you want someone to come and dedicate their time for your youth 24-7, it's not just the lectures that they're given or the activities. These di youth directors are getting calls from the, from the youth all day, all night long with problems, with questions, with these conversations. And I'm sure all of you know this. There has to be some type of motivation for the Shabab, for the youth that want to come and make this a full-time career for them. They need to dedicate proper pace for even our Imams. Imams are getting paid poorly out in many of the masajid. You know, now the only high, you know, if you have to be one of those big star, high, you know, high class Imams that we all know of to get paid really well. But other than that, you're still getting paid anywhere between 60 to 70,000 and they may consider that extremely high. So it is, that's one part that I am honestly that I think is, you know, the Messiah take fault in. Um, but I also do believe that the youth themselves have to take initiative. The youth, um, the Messiah are there. The Imams are there. Um, there are plenty of resources out there. But I think the youth, they need to take the initiative. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ that he guides whomever he, whomever he wants, and he will misguide whomever he wants. From a linguistic point of view, linguistically or Lugawiyan, when anyone reads that ayah, or even the way I intentionally translated it right now, that he guides whomever he wants. People think that, you know, the ayah, the tafsir of it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide whomever Allah wants to guide. But the ayah, Lugawiyan and Istalahiyan, from the tafsir point of view, Yudillu man yasha, wa yahdi man yasha, that Allah will guide man yasha, the one who wants guidance. So if you want guidance, if you want the hidayah, anta man tasha, you are the one that wants the guidance, Allah will give it to you. And if you want to be misguided, Yudillu ayyuman man yasha, the one who wants the misguidance. Because I've heard people come and say, well, Allah hasn't guided me yet. Or may Allah guide me. No, you have to go and seek that guidance. You have to want that guidance. May yurdillahu an yashrah sadrahu an yahdihu yashrah sadrahu lil Islam. That if you want Allah to guide you, open your heart towards Islam. You, you should want to accept Islam. You should want to be amongst the, you know, the great salihin. You have to understand that yawm al-qiyamah, the Prophet mentions, لن تزول قدم عبد يوم al-qiyamah حتى يسأل عن أربع وفي رواية عن خمسة that your, your hisab, your judgment will not be concluded يوم القيامة unless you are asked about five things and, and number three on that list وعن شبابه فيما أفنا you'll be asked about your youth age what you've done with it how you spent it it's not about you know YOLO you only live once it's not about just enjoy the current moment right now it's not about it's about wanting to live that life of Iman. And lastly, I think if there's any type of blame, and we really can't blame society, but society plays a huge role. And when I talk about society, I'm not just talking about the non-Muslims. I'm talking about the Muslims themselves. 
last khutbah that I gave, it was talk, it was, I was talking about the hadith of Ghuraba, strangers, where the Prophet mentions that Islam began strange and will return to being strange again. So glad tidings for the strangers. And I mentioned that during when Islam first began, yes, it began strange. Because the Arabs of Quraysh, a lot of the Islamic teachings were strange to them. Starting with the number one concept and the most important message of Islam, the Tawheed, they had 360 idols around the Kaaba. And when the Prophet said to worship one God in Surah As-Safat, they mentioned, they said, Surah Sad, wahida, inna hadha la ujab. Ujab means strange, that did he really make us or is telling us to worship only one God? Indeed, that is strange. He says, and Islam will return to being strange again. Which means between the first strange, the beginning, and the last strange at the end, in the middle, Islam was normal. It was accepted. It was adopted by the world. You know, Muslims conquered so many countries. But he said it will return to being strange again. Today, when we look at Islam, Islam has become strange not only amongst the non-Muslims. Islam has become strange even amongst Muslims themselves. And to give you just an example today, how many parents, Ya Sheikh Najm, do you know from the thousands of parents that their top concern is that they want their kids to become scholars and go to a Alim program first? It is not the case. I, guys, I, myself, growing up in that bio that you see on the screen of 14 years of age, I had immediate family members, cousins, relatives, aunts, uncles, they thought because I chose the path of seeking knowledge that I am a failure in my academic side of, of life, that I wasn't smart enough. And I grew up facing this challenge that I, people thought I wasn't smart enough to do, become an engineer, to become you know, a doctor. I have two engineers in the family. I have two doctors for my brothers. I have, we have four brothers. Two do, I have four other, we're five total brothers. Two doctors, two engineers. In people's minds, I'm the only one that went astray and became an imam. And that challenge happens a lot where we don't have the support from community members, from family members to want to encourage our kids to learn about Islam. And please, parents who are here or youth, don't take my message right now that I'm saying drop out of school and go sit at a masjid. No, you can do them simultaneously. Wallahi. If you dedicate an hour, and I'm telling you an hour or two a day of reading something or joining a class or a lecture, that library behind me right there is a collection of every hadith book that has been since Imam Malik, rahimahullah, and Ahmed, all the way down. Every hadith collection. I had, for the last 13 years, dedicated three hours a day. For people, that may be a lot. Three hours a day, I have put every book behind me from cover to cover, alhamdulillah. It's the will that you want. But at the same time, you are able and capable of doing, you know, learning your deen, being steadfast on your deen, but also, you know, studying whatever it is you want to be, a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer. There's no contradiction between them. There's nothing wrong with between them. But you have to have that will to learn about your deen. It is sad. It is sad and heartbreaking that our youth today don't know the absolute basics of their deen. There's so much that someone, a Muslim brother, subhanAllah, came to me, born in, and raised Muslim, asked me, called me over the phone with his non-Muslim friend. He said his non-Muslim friend asked him a question that he would like me to answer. I'm thinking of something about the Bible, comparison of Islam, something major. He said his non-Muslim friend asked him, why do you Muslims all wear a white towel around you and walk around a black building multiple times. He didn't know how to answer the question. Even if you say it's our hedge, that in itself isn't just an answer. They want to know the significance behind it. And I want everyone here that's listening to think about this specific question and see how you could have answered that specific question. Taman Sheikh Najman, our lovely imams are not included. You guys are, mashallah, you are dear scholars. Like in the audience, think about the, a question as simple as this. Do I know the answer to that? The significance behind it? I'm not going to look it up. Just ask yourself without looking it up what that answer in your mind looks like. And there's just so much more. Um, so it's, again, in, in, in summary, I think the society plays a role. 
in our youth not being as involved because there's not much motivation. Alhamdulillah, there are a lot of youth that are involved in the Masaid, but there are a lot more. As um, our brother Aqil with the stats that he brought up earlier, that are literally completely off track. And there's not the right motivation for them, unfortunately. Um, I think Masajid, um, they're trying. Um, they, they're, there is definitely a place for improvements on how they can um, support our youth more. Um, but also, I think it is both the youth need to be involved. Um, the Masajid need to be involved. There should be support from society. And as you mentioned, Brother Najim, earlier, the most important aspect are the parents at home. Parents, you cannot bring your children to three hours a week to a Sunday school from 10 to 1 and think that your kids are going to become Sahaba or going to become scholars. I promise you that's not going to be the case. That is not going to be the case three hours a week. There has to be an initiative from the parents to make sure that the kids are more involved in, in a more loving manner. And for them to love that, they cannot see the father sitting at home praying late or not even praying at all, regardless you know, of how he does. The mother is not wearing a hijab. There's just so much fundamentals that the parents have to show their kids as they are growing up for their kids to want to, um, for their kids to want to be better people. Um, I think that pretty much summarizes my points. Um, I wanted to make uh, my points a little different from the other brothers. Alhamdulillah, I think we covered different types and different aspects of this conversation. So I will go ahead and um, let Brother Najim, inshallah ta'ala, um, go ahead and ask his questions if there's any. Barakallah feek um, for, for your input. Um, uh, the points are well taken. Um, so uh, you hit on some, uh, some great points too about uh, the massages actually uh, really investing and paying those uh, community leaders, right? Because they're very instrumental, the imams and the youth directors uh, and other personnel too that really are needed uh, in our masajids, right? So that is something I think uh, that hopefully some masjids are on that track, right? And some of them are just like, no, volunteer. We need you to volunteer for khutbah, for salah, you know, like you, you have this you know, kind of mentality uh, and, uh, that still exists. Um, the other point that I wanted to ask um, is that um, when the, what, what would you advise what type of advice would you give to the Muslim community um, when you see that there isn't that effort being done um, for the Muslim youth? Who would you address and who would you speak to? And is there a systematic way of doing that? So this is the first question, and then we'll ask you the other question afterwards. The first question, I think that's a, a topic for the board, of course. Um, the board who I sometimes um, get the impression, um, again, this is my personal impression and opinion, that the board, whenever they're assigned to become board members or they're voted in, they somewhat think that the money that's there belongs to them. And they control it however they want. And I know and I have seen it. I have seen it in plenty of Masad that I have worked or volunteered with for a long time that they have the right to control this money however they want, while the community members, they want, you know, um, that money to be used to certain, re or for resources, for for the right people. But personally speaking, I, I worked as an imam, as a full-time imam in youth director for eight years, since 2000 and um, since 2012. And from 2019 until now is when I transferred over to the IT field because I realized as an imam, there's no growth. Like I am still young. And the way I, I, I'm seeing how Masayid are that have a million, two million in their banks, but they're paying these imams, their youth directors, 60, 70,000. That is a junior level position in any professional field. Alhamdulillah, I mean, going into the IT field one makes you for me I feel independent because a lot of ask a lot of times when you're being paid to do work at the mission there are some deep spiritual matters that I, I would like to discuss in different sessions like ikhlas you don't always feel like you're doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah yes there are times where you're sincere but sometimes you're just either busy or you you know you, you are just honestly not in the right state of mind to give a class or an activity. 
but you go ahead and do it because it is on your contract because the board is going to get you in trouble because they're going to keep you accountable for it when you're independent and you have your own source of income and you're perfectly you know independent from a side and you're doing it voluntarily every time and i've seen the difference in myself that now i go to the masjid when i have the time and it, i feel like my talks my activities are so sincere for the sake of Allah because i'm not getting paid for it and i don't want to get paid for it but at the same time if you are hiring youth shabab that they chose and dedicated time to go spend four years in medina or five years or you know in an island program and they come here to work at a masjid pay them well let them feel like they are out of give them six figures why can't they have a hundred thousand dollars why not let them drive a nice mercedes a nice bmw a nice car whatever the case may be but we cannot have our imams struggling and they're working side jobs and they an imam is an imam at a masjid but is going to teach you know hifth program in a different institute or has his own school on the side to make a living i mean i live in northern virginia and it's extremely expensive i don't know how it is in i know new york is it's crazy expensive an imam cannot live off a six seventy thousand dollars salary there you cannot but i think that that mentality needs to change and i'm a part of um amja which is the um the uh, american muslim jurist uh association i believe i i forget what it stands for but and i go there every year for their conference and this talk has been brought up by the 400 imams that attend multiple times that they are underpaid under you know they're not respected they're undervalued it's it doesn't give anyone motivation honestly to want to be in a place where you're just always being you know unvalued for like a better words yeah and I, I think that has also deterred a lot of students who come back uh, and who have the talent and the skill set and the knowledge from their overseas uh, islamic uh, studying and it actually deters them from going in and working for the community because, you know and being servants if you want to say uh, you know to the muslim community because of that lack of of salary gap you know and it's something that we advocate and we push for and we hope that the masajids uh, you know they can you know take all those factors into consideration because the imam is in charge of the community you know and you know and for a lot of us too we, we you know for the, the good imams we've connected a lot with the, with with them with their personality with their teaching so we benefit a lot you know from them the other question i would ask um is something that dr abu zaid had mentioned too is that you know this this issue of of blaming and then we have to you know hold actually personal accountability and I think this is very important too, because now something that I've noticed as I worked in, you know, uh, the Islamic school or some of the Islamic schools, is that you kind of get a sense that, and I don't know if you see you see this and you observe this, but a lot of the Muslim youth, not all of them, not all of them, I don't want to overgeneralize, but you find that now they have more resources than we did when we were younger, right? So they have access to these big gyms, these, these massive Islamic schools and stuff like this. But now they're thinking they, they feel or they appear and they behave as this if they're privileged. So they don't have to work for anything anymore, you know? And I've, and I've definitely seen this with a lot of uh, some of these Islamic schools and the parents are just paying tuition. So the children feel like, they can do what they want. They can get the grades that they want, even though they, didn't, they don't deserve it. They don't put in the time. And you see a lot of akhlaq, a lot of adab is just missing. So what would you say uh, to this? Do you see this issue? Because, um, you know, we're not holding measures accountable for this, but we actually see youth who do not hold themselves accountable and they just feel entitled to some of the, the things that are, are there in their community. Shuf, um, I personally, I, I've always had made this statement um, this had this belief, and I still stand for that belief, which is in every zaman in Meccan, every time and place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring certain resources based off of, you know, the passion of the Muslim community, right? And I'm going to explain that in a second. Let's look back at the time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, and the Tabi'een, the four Imams, Malik, Abu Hanifa, Shafi, Ahmed, Bukhari, those people, look what they went through to seek knowledge. They traveled on, on foot or camels thousands of miles to go learn hadith, to go learn fiqh. Their passion, their spirit, their iman was so high that that was normal for them. 
Allah knew, knew and knows that in the 21st century, we are going to be so lazy and not have that passion that we have Zoom. Like, look right now, we are in like, what, at least the audience, the 20 people here, I can say we're in probably 10 different states or 15 different states. But Allah made it. Imagine if Najm, you called and said, guys, let's have this meeting in Tampa, Florida. All you guys fly in or drive in. You would have been there by yourself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the appropriate resources out of rahmah for us. Why? Because Allah says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا we will not punish anyone unless every type of reasoning has been you know, given to them. And you have no other excuse left. So now we have recorded videos. If you missed this Zoom, it's recorded and you get to watch it later. There is YouTube videos all over. And still the youth, like you said, feel entitled. And that is said sometimes, yes, we are, we are in need more of adab than we are in need of knowledge. And that's why I personally... A lot of my lectures, they could be very emotional, but somewhere in the middle, I have to be tough. We're talking still, but only 15 years ago, where I was in Sudan, going to Masayid that have no fans, no ACs, the carpets were torn. You would sit on the ground for 7 to 10 hours a day with a notebook writing down the notes of the sheikh. The water, you go get water that is warm to drink it. Food, you're talking about the most basic food. But at the time, we didn't care. We were enjoying the life of learning the hadith, aqidah, fiqh, tafsir, all these things from Mashayikh. I'm not talking about 100 and 200 years ago. I'm talking about 15 years ago in my country in Sudan. For there is just so much that comes with it that, yes, sometimes the masajid with what they've offered the youth they do feel entitled. And that's why I, I earlier, I'm, you know, during my talk, I put some of the blame on the youth that they need to save themselves. We can try. We can try, bring imams, youth directors, build large facilities for you. But at the end of the day, we cannot guide anybody. The guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will continue to serve. We will continue to travel and try to help our youth until our very last breath, inshallah. But at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You cannot guide whomever you please or whomever you want. It's all it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. MashaAllah. So uh, very great points, I think, um, and hitting on the 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 rihra of the Talib al ilm you know. Um, and, and I remember, uh, you know, when I was in Fez studying, um, just for a short period of time, and actually, that's where I actually met uh, Dr. Abu Zaid. Uh, alhamdulillah, he's been a student of knowledge. He's a sheikh as well, but taking from ulama. But I remember just going to um, one of my teachers, and I was learning Nahu and Sarf at, at his at his place. And he was, you know, he, you know, was very very poor. And I still learn, uh, you know, Arabic from him. And I'm still taking, you know, my studies because um, obviously, you know, it, the journey never ends, right? It's just sometimes when you come back here. It just get you know goes on pause or because you become so busy right but i just remember like having to take a, like a bus and a taxi and then i have to go walk inside the medina qadima and like and there it's like small alleys and i was just thinking i like subhanallah like like what did like the ulama of the past you know what did they you know uh, what did they do you know to get to acquire their ilm traveling thousands of miles without car we do need sayyara, al ta'ira, you know, no, no, like, and no. Brother Nigel, let me ask you this question. If you had an opportunity to, to redo that again, wouldn't you do it again? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it feels amazing. It, it has this feeling inside of joy and halawa al iman that I really wish that we could express that feeling to our youth today. Yeah, subhanAllah. I, I always think about it, and, you know, it's something that, you know, you, we always have met them with. The regret that you know you can't go back and do those things because and and that's where you know some of the ulama too have heard that they explain um the hadith of you know whoever lost uh, uh, uh what's the hadith so you know and some scholars have heard that because the, allah makes the path easy for jannah for the talib al-ilm because of what he has to go through on his journey to actually seek ilm 
and it's not something easy, right? Because you're, you're not working in most cases, you know, um, you know, you're, you're, you're having to walk all these places and travel and sit and be patient and just wait for one lesson at a time and take notes and you don't understand your brain is hurting, you know, so, it, it, you know, you go through a lot of hardships, you know, um, but it's something that I definitely appreciated um, and it makes you a better person and a better man, I would say, you know, so, um, but only a few people uh, and those uh, shiuk and, and tulab, they understand that truly whoever has been on those journeys. So those people who've studied for years, you know, Allah subhanahu has blessed, you know, uh, blessed them and increased them in knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. With with that, uh, we will be closing. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I think it was a very fruitful uh, conversation. And, you know, we know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu when he mentioned, whoever does not thank a people is not grateful to Allah or he, whoever does not thank a people is not does not thank Allah. So we thank uh, our dear speakers, Dr. Abu Zayd, uh, Sheikh Akhil Ingram, Sheikh Yasser for their time and their effort in speaking about, which I believe is a very, very needed uh, or was a very, or is a very needed uh, discussion within our communities because, you know, one of the reasons to, and if I reflect back on my experiences and, and, and my peers, our experiences growing up in the masjids, you know, I saw what is the difference that kept us in the masjid versus the, the one that used to come in Ramadan or the one that used to come on Friday or for or for Eid or something. What what was the differences? You know, and I've noticed that some some of the Muslims have had bad experiences growing up in the masajid. It, it, it wasn't all peaches and cream, right? I've even seen, uh, subhanAllah, like brothers have physically, uh, you know, assaulted youth in the masajids. And, you know, I'm sure that was a deterrent from them forever coming back. And there was no one ever checked them in that, you know? And then so you have a youth who's left the mas masjid, perhaps left Islam, and no one knows where he is, you know? Uh, youth not having structured programs in the mas masjid. No one, uh, and we see this in Ramadan when, when thousands of kids are running outside and they have no structure and no guidance. You can never do that in a school. You, you can never, except during uh, recess time, right? Yeah. Or in a job, if you bring kids to a job, you will never see kids behave like that. So, you know, there are a lot of things that I think we've seen uh, in our masjids um, that we would love for them to improve on, as well as the self-accountability that, that a youth has to, has to take and taking ownership of what he is capable or he or she is capable of. Another thing we really didn't get to touch on was the, the importance of engaging the Muslim sisters. As uh, Dr. Uh, Abu Zaid mentioned, one of the positions is for that, uh, mm -hmm. that youth coordinator, but also someone for the sisters. Whatever we create for the brothers, we should create for the sisters, that female counselor, that female support, that, you know, the, the ustada. Uh, for the sisters, a, a youth director for the sisters, right? So, you know, go ahead, go ahead. Matter of fact, subhanAllah, I had that on my notes right here to, to comment on it. Just give me one minute on this on this topic. Okay. If I were to answer that specific question on, on the theme of this uh, of this uh, lecture today, I would say yes. The main thing that Messiah have failed our youth um, isn't just the youth, but it's our sisters at large. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I Every masjid I've been to, I have asked the mas the masajid to find a female sister um, to bring her full time for our sisters, because no matter how knowledgeable you are as an imam, um, there are some times where sisters feel more comfortable speaking with other sisters that are knowledgeable, and if those resources are not available, I think it is the masjid's obligation to take a few sisters from the community and pay their full you know expenses and you know education to be educated and trained and come back and serve their community. So it is a very sad predicament and a sad situation that our sisters don't have the right attention. And the Prophet ﷺ dedicated himself a day a week, an entire day for the sisters and the, and the women to answer all their questions, to educate them. During the khutbah of, of Eid, he dedicated the entire second khutbah just as an advice for the sisters. But at the same time, we also had Aisha, we had other, you know, scholars from the from the Sahaba that were women that did such a tremendous job. They don't have that today. The sisters that are around that speak, famous speakers or known speakers, they're not scholars. They're either, you know, activists or just they're good in talking. But we need a sister that is knowledgeable, a alima, that can teach tafsir, hadith, aqidah, extensive knowledge. Um, we do need that in our community, subhanAllah. 
and I remember um, and going over one of the, uh, the explanations of, uh, of the Musnad, and I can't remember if it's uh, Ibn Rajab, uh, but uh, don't quote me on that. But I remember the scholar mentioning that Imam Ahmad, alayhi, that he narrated, some scholars say, uh, 60 female scholars from Hadith. And some other scholars say that he narrated from 100 females or 100 female ulama, right? So, uh, right? Uh, um, uh, so that shows you that, you know, and it, it often gets overlooked that the contribution of Muslim female scholars towards the Hadith scholars, because the, the, the male presence gets, in, in many cases, dominated over the female presence, right? But a lot of our Hadith ulama and, and fuqaha and stuff like this, they learned from very significant uh, uh, female scholars in the past, and it had a huge impact on them, you know? Um, so, subhanAllah. Abu Hanifa's daughter, uh, Abu Hanifa's daughter, when she got married, her husband was a student of Abu Hanifa as well. And on the very first day of their marriage, he wants to go to Abu Hanifa's class. Yeah. Very first day. And look at look at the compassion and, and, and the passion that he had to go seek knowledge on his first day of wedding. We're talking about honeymoons and trips and all that. And she asks him, where are you going? He was like, I'm going to your father's class. And she said, Ijlis fama indahu indi. Sit down. What he has, I also have. The same knowledge he has, I have. I'll teach you at home. Where do we find those women today, subhanAllah? <laughs> it, it is scarce. And I think that is a, um, it is a systematic issue that really has to be addressed, you know, nationwide. Because you can't find uh, female scholars, uh, you know, to go and even sit. Even if I wanted to go and sit from take, like, what's the number here in America? You know, maybe just a few of the ones that we see on YouTube, you know, but <laughs> Other than that, in your local community, who are the ones that you can go? Um, so it definitely is a, another issue and another uh, lecture for another day, inshallah ta'ala. But it is something to pay attention to that the women do have. And, and another uh, short point I'll mention uh, before we actually to make a dua to close um, is that I remember one time I visited Spain, uh, Madrid. And I think, I can't remember if my mom or my daughter was with me. Uh, so, so someone was with me. Um, and we went to one of the masjids in the city center in Madrid. Um, and it was a nice experience, alhamdulillah. But when we got the, to the masjid, I was looking for the sister section. I was like, okay, maybe the doors are on this alley, you know, or, or somewhere here. And I asked the brother, I said, where's the sister section? And he says, had the masjid, khas lirijal. You know, he said, the masjid is only uh, specific for the men. I was, I was like, I just kind of like scratched my head. I was like, what did, um, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, he's like, don't prevent your, your women folk from uh, the masjid, right? So, uh, you know, um, so it is something I think uh, across the board, some, some places don't have that, you know, and it's something that we should be cognizant of. But um, alhamdulillah, we thank all of our speakers. Um, Sheikh Akhil, also he has some classes online that he streams. Um, so if you go on Facebook and you could, uh, uh, you know, find him and, and listen to his lectures. Uh, Dr. Abu Zaid has a ton of classes that I see on his website and many students are benefiting from. Sheikh Yasser as well, is active in his community and giving back. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of them. And uh, as a reminder, you know, this is our monthly online lecture and we hope to do more of these things with these thought provoking uh, concepts and topics, you know, so that we can uh, change our minds in order uh, to help change our communities. And with that, I'll ask Sheikh Yasser uh, to make a close. Yes, there's uh, there's my son, Dr. Aqil here. He's older in age and okay. way ahead of us, seniority wise. I don't know. Know. If he's still here, uh, or, or Sheikh uh, uh, Dr. Abu Zaid and Akil, I, did, I don't know if you're still here, but hell, hell, are you two still here? They might they might have uh, logged off. Or... Okay. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala thumma ma ba'd. Allahumma ati nufusana taqwaha wa zakiha anta khayru man zakaha. أنت وليها ومولاها اللهم اجعل عملنا كله في رضاك واغننا برحمتك عمن سواك وعمر قلوبنا بتقواك واجعلنا نخشاك حتى نراك إلى يوم نلقاك اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم واغفر لنا إنك أنت الغفور الرحيم اللهم أنت الله لا إله إلا أنت أنت الغني ونحن الفقراء أنزل علينا الغيث ولا تجعلنا من القانتين اللهم تقبل منا يا أرحم الراحمين يا رب العالمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة